My name is Bodo Sieber. Uh, if you're wondering where that name is from, uh, I'm German, which also might explain my funny accent. I spend my time between Cape Town uh, in South Africa, Ireland, where we incorporated as Tag Marshall and obviously the US where uh, the bulk of our business happens. Um, thank you all for joining. Five ways to turn pace of play into a golf experience and revenue asset. It's nice to see uh, some familiar faces, including uh, Donald Archibald, who's up at Carnoustie. Uh, we've got Jim Lombardo from Aaron Hills and obviously a number of others and uh, a lot of new faces that we haven't touched base with yet. So welcome to you. Um, who's Tag Marshall? Let's have a look. We are a golf course intelligence system. We have tracked 7 million rounds. We've collected 900 million data points. We work with 200 courses in nine countries. We're also a research and technology partner to EasyLinks, which is a PGA Tour company. We're working with the USGA and the AJGA, among others. And obviously, are very, very fortunate in working with some of the very best courses and operational teams on this beautiful planet. Uh, among them, Oakmont, uh, Carnoustie, which I've mentioned, Aaron Hills, uh, Kiowa, uh, Whistling Straits, Valhalla, uh, California Icon, whose name I can't mention <laughs> without getting into copyright uh, trouble, um, Pinehurst. Um, I believe it's eight of the top 10 US public courses, but also a number of uh, really good private clubs. Um, and the bulk of our courses obviously operate in the 30 40 $50 green fee space or in the run-of-the-mill private space. So there's lots of um, width in, in data and approaches, and we are very fortunate in uh, getting great feedback and learnings from this market all the time. One of the things that we've learned is what's important to them, and the key and the be-all and end-all is the golfer experience. So enhancing golfer experience is important. Boosting operational efficiencies, how can we do this better? Optimizing field flow and pace of play. Um, surprisingly, that is very important. Improving service delivery, always a winner. And obviously, um, and most of these places are run as a business, safe costs and unlock revenues. The golfer's buying decision is something that we need to look at if we want to look at experience because um, golf is competing with other experiences, among them cycling, going to the movies, doing nothing, sitting on the couch and watching Netflix. There's many out there. Um, there's also a level of experience in terms of world class. Uh, we've mentioned some of these amazing courses uh, down to the course down the road uh, in terms of um, amazing private club down to, okay, this is where I meet my mate's uh, private club and get to play around. Obviously, with this comes cost. What's my budget range? Uh, where, where am I comfortable? And time. Time is important. When can I do this? I've got a busy life. And how long does it take me? So experience, time, and cost are key variables. And this is something that, uh, that we're going to get back to. So what we want to do today is look at five ways to turn pace of play into a golf experience and revenue asset. And the five as follows, you would have uh, probably seen this on the invite. The first one is consistency, the importance of providing a consistent product and play experience. Number two, flow equals experience. Uh, note that it's not pace, but it's flow. Measuring how on-course flow has a direct imp impact on the golf experience. Number three, smarter starter. We're looking at one of those variables that we really want to highlight. How smarter starter processes set the pace and keep golfers accountable. And then we're looking at the bottom line. Time equals bottom line, how time influences bottom line results, the risk and opportunity. And uh, round two of this, time equals money, some real life experiences and uh, examples. Okay, let's get straight into it. Obviously, if at any time you have any questions, uh, you can just type them out. And after this uh, session, there'll also be a couple of minutes where you can type through questions and ask questions. Consistency. Very, very important. So one thing that uh, helps me understand the space better, because I must warn you, I'm not a golfer. Um, I'm a software and data analyst uh, by trade. And this is uh, where I've um, you know, spent the last decade and a bit uh, um, honing my, my skill. And, and obviously, this is something that I'm bringing into the golf space. Um, it always helps to understand a space through different eyes. 
and a different perspective. Um, so one of the things that I would like to do is look at expectations versus reality and um, how consistency and experience pans out in other fields outside of the golf course. And one of uh, those fields that we can all relate to is the restaurant space um, because we're all guests at a restaurant, maybe tonight, maybe this week, uh, most certainly this month. And that experience, time and cost uh, equation also very much matters here. So the, the questions we need to ask ourselves in terms of experience and consistency is how forgiving are we as customers if there are wait times and delays in the service? If our steak takes 40 minutes too long and it's overdone, the quality is not good. Uh, if breakfast is great on a Tuesday but terrible on a Saturday, um, how does it influence our loyalty and our willingness to return and refer this place? And how many chances do we give a service provider? So this is something that uh, we can all relate to and we also know how unforgiving we are generally because there's lots of options and everybody wants our attention and uh, everybody wants our money. So uh, this is uh, one way of looking at it and this is also one way that we can keep ourselves honest in the space that we're in. So how do these industries improve and, and optimize? Firstly, they understand the variables. They want to know how can we do this better Tuesday versus Friday versus Saturday? How uh, can we understand staff efficiencies and motivation? Uh, we know who our top sellers are. We know what our top sellers are. We know um, how, to, uh, how to manage our kitchen staff in time in terms of a high or low customer volume. We're setting standards, we're tracking data, uh, we track and manage performance and we look for continuous improvement. And this is something that happens in the background at virtually every business. And it's something that also happens in golf uh, to some extent. And obviously some operators are doing this really well and others are uh, getting the flow of it. So if we ask the same questions in the golf space and we can here look at, at Aaron Hills, which is a standout uh, US open host facility with a, a Royal Green fee. Um, they certainly know how to provide experience. Um, there's also courses like Bent Creek, uh, which is a $25 round facility. Um, also there, I'm, I'm getting a certain experience. And there's also private clubs like uh, Valhalla, where uh, Tiger famously won um, a major. And uh, um, in comparison to this, Wisconsin club is a, a very modest club in, in Milwaukee. But even here, it, it comes down to experiences. What can I get when I join this place? So how forgiving are we as customers if there are wait times and delays out on the course is one of the questions. What if my experience is not up to scratch? If the course condition is excellent, but the flow is poor and the route around is slow, this is something that we'll get to because conditioning, obviously, key experience factor in golf, but how can we make this shine? If my round starts 20 minutes late, it takes 40 minutes longer than expected, how forgiving am I? If the golf experience is great on a Tuesday, but terrible on a Saturday, we're talking about consistency, right? How does it influence our loyalty, willingness to return and refer? We must be honest with ourselves and ask these tough questions because we are doing it in other industries. So why not apply it to ourselves? So one of the key things, and we're looking to understand this, um, is to understand the variables. And there are obviously a number of them in golf. There's setup variables, there's planable variables, and there's process variables. This is not an exhaustive list, but uh, one of the setup uh, sections you would look at layout conditioning slope rating green speeds those are all set up uh, planable variables are player volume you should know what's coming in on certain days of the week what's the weather going to be like what's the expected player quality what's the staff quality you've got at hand uh, what's the staff scheduling like what are the daylight hours those are planable and then you've got a long list of process variables what are your starter processes your intervals your goal times your bottleneck management marshalling how do you inform and educate, which is part of the process? And that uh, obviously relates to members, but also to guests. Um, how do you get oversight? How do you gather data? How do you performance manage? Those are all process variables. Ultimately, what it comes down to is using data to manage variables and empower consistency. So this is where consistency comes from. If we understand what we're doing, then we can use data strategically to solve problems that we know we have, solve problems that we didn't know we have, and obviously build on good processes and strength. And, and how? Because practically with data, we can improve the ability to manage, we can create a culture of continuous improvement, and we can improve ultimately the golf, ex golf experience, which is why we're here. So data is key in providing consistency. Let's jump ahead. 
um, we want to look at how flow equals experience on the golf course, measuring how the on-course flow has a direct impact on the golf experience. Let's have a look. So what does a golf experience look like in terms of time? And remember, we looked at experience, time, and cost as those three factors. And if we break down the time that we're making available uh, to have that experience, we're looking at probably more or less, depending how punctual you are, um, against my, my nation's reputation, I tend to be a minute late rather than five minutes early. Um, arrive and check in, 20 minutes, um, have a few putts and drives, uh, warm up a bit, 20 minutes. Um, some people like to extend that, some people don't take this much time. Then I'm expecting to be on the course for four hours, if the course a bit longer, maybe 420, of course a bit shorter, uh, maybe a bit less, then certainly after that I want to shower and dress and then it's time for beers because I've been um, out on the course with my friends who I've been looking forward to seeing all week um, or with colleagues or with uh, business partners and uh, we spend a lot of time out there so it's time for food and, uh, and something to drink. So the time budget that I'm making available here is 6 hours and 37 hours, 5.30. It's quite considerable, especially in this day and age. And this is something that uh, golf uh, and the USGA, for instance, have identified as a challenge, the amount of time it takes to play a round of golf. Um, to this, obviously, you must add uh, your transport there and home. And if you want to know uh, about time budget, then... Uh, try and add another two hours to burgers and beers and then you know somebody's going to help you manage and that uh, comes in the form of missed calls from your significant other. Okay, so now if we're looking at this breakdown, the on-course experience, four hours, the on-course time spent. So the question is, is our job done once the players are out on the course? We've done everything we can, conditioning's great, maybe we're lucky with the weather, um, we market it so people come to our place or uh, we've got a member base that we're engaging with and get them out on the course. Um, in our course uh, is our course process and experience management out there on the course nice to have or is, is it essential? Because we're doing a lot in that, uh, that first um, arrive and check in and dress and the, the putt and drive. We're doing a lot here around uh, touch points and experience and uh, with staff touch points and obviously there's our clubhouse that's uh, hopefully an attraction and afterwards um, in our bar in our grill uh, we're really looking after people and there's lots of service touch points but out on the course for four hours uh, what are we doing to make sure that that experience really works out so let's paint a picture of that uh, experience that you loathe to have as a golfer but you love to complain about so let's just paint a really horrendous picture of things that really can go wrong out there if the variables aren't adjusted and managed well so um, it's a saturday beautiful weather you're um, out with your mates it's late morning but for some other reason um, the field is already jammed and you're starting 20 minutes late okay can happen now the starter is sending you out and because they're built under pressure he's reduced the time gap to six minutes and obviously you guys want to get going um, so unfortunately six minutes time gap results in the next part three which is down on the second there's a bottleneck you have to wait for the other guys to clear in front of you. Okay, you carry on playing. And around about the fourth, you're now eight minutes behind and you keep having to wait. And you're not quite sure, is the whole day slow? Is it just the guys in front of us? Um, this continues. Now you're 15 minutes behind. Um, now you're unlucky at the turn. The drinks cards just left for a shift change. Okay, this can happen. Uh, but you really would have loved to have a beer now. Um, two thirds into the round, you're 20 minutes behind and now the marshal comes and tells you you're slow. And you're like, look, uh, we really would uh, like to believe you, but uh, we really believe it's the guys in front of us. And, uh, and we know that we're off the pace, but so is everybody else, so get lost. So you're not having a very good experience with the marshal at this point. And uh, who is he to come and lecture you um, that you really just wanted to have a great round out, out there today. Um, on top of that, your flow is interrupted and many of you might be rhythm players. So if you're conscious to get your flow and your rhythm going, and um, then maybe your scores go down a bit and this obviously adds to um, the experience that you don't want to have. At the end of it, you come through at 18 minutes and you're 40 minutes behind goal time. So that means you're 40 minutes over. Well, you expect it to be out there for four hours and something, something and now it's 40 minutes over. Um, how do you feel about it? Well, let's look at what we've actually done now to this playing group. So if the time budget 6.30, we started them 
20 minutes late. We're playing them four hours and 40. So we've taken out, uh, they need to now shower and dress. Okay, we've taken out the opportunity for a burger and beer. And there have been lots of uh, sort of negative experience touch points in terms of um, starter didn't handle too well. Um, the marshal just uh, got up their noses. There were delays at the at the wrong point, and ultimately, once once I can't have my burger and beer after the round because I need to get somewhere, or I'm going to be in trouble at home, and this is not going to help me either. So the time budget and time is critical with regards to the experience. Um, and if we look back at the experience and what actually matters to the golfers. We all know conditioning is key and the layout. We want a challenging course. At the same time, we want playability. We want staff and service levels to be appropriate to the, the, the budget that I have available. And we want uh, to do this in a decent clubhouse or in an exceptional clubhouse. And the food and beverage must match it. And obviously, the flow and the pace is part of it. But now what happens, if we're going back to this picture, everything that we're providing as a course pales because of these friction points and because you're stealing my time. So the conditioning, the layout, the, the playability, the service staff, the clubhouse, all pales because all I remember is the flow wasn't right. I was held up. You've stolen an hour out of my life and I can't have beers with my friends. So this is a, this is a big risk. Um, so the flow of the course is a major experience factor. And we have had this confirmed, and obviously that is why a lot of people work with us. But uh, so if others, uh, the USGA, for instance, say that 74% of golfers believe the pace is crucial to the enjoyment of their round. 43% of golfers, the pace can be improved at the course that they play the most. Well, this is probably kind. And that is probably also a question of what status quo have we accepted as golfers? And maybe we accepting that, yeah, there's many variables and it's just not possible to control it really well. Meanwhile, if we're going out to a restaurant, we've got absolutely no patience and we will absolutely punish uh, poor um, execution and poor service levels. Um, lastly, 60% of golfers say they would enjoy golf more if they played in less time. So here, the time and the time I'm making available is a valuable asset to me, especially um, if I'm a younger golfer. So this is actually turning into a risk for me uh, can I not play 10 times this year or can I play 30 times this year or can I not play at all this month because uh, it takes so much time to play. So if I can make this easier as a golf operator and if I can provide consistency around the expectations and around uh, the service delivery, then I can probably gain a few golfers and not do something good for the sport. Um, the one thing that we want to do is we want to understand variables. So one of them and we said we want to track data. So one of them is uh, and a classic golf uh, sort of data tracking metric is uh, tracking the, the average round time versus goal time. So here's an example. There's an Arizona course and they want to play to that magic four hours. And in March, which is their high season where they do around about 3,300 rounds, they came in on average at 406. So that looks good, right? Now, um, I've warned you that I'm a data scientist and obviously this uh, has influenced a lot where, uh, where our uh, technology is going. So if we're looking a bit deeper under the hood of this average and we have to remember and maybe it's a good time to bring back the, uh, the analogy of the restaurant business. If you're going to Starbucks um, and it's 10 o'clock and they've this morning served 100 coffees and you're asking, so how is the quality of your coffee today and the service? They say on average it was good, but what does that mean? Maybe some were too hot and some were too cold and some were delivered uh, at such a pace um, that they landed on somebody's lap and others were a bit late. But on average, things map out. So average is not necessarily a good indicator. So that's, this is where data is really helpful if you can look under the hood and if you can really look at uh, the, the deeper meaning of the data. So what this course, even at, this, at the surface, a positive result, what they found is that 73% of their rounds were actually not on pace. And out of those, um, there was a significant percentage that was 40 minutes over or between 30 and 40 minutes over. And because that, all they ever did was look at average round times, they never realized the opportunity that they have to really provide a better service and a better experience to their players. Now, this is, um, this is a novel way of looking at, at this. Um, and here's one example of what's possible if those variables get controlled. Um, this is a, a very famous course that you would have all seen on TV a few, few weeks ago, and they certainly know how to, 
how to run uh, an excellent um, uh, operation. And I mean, they're world, world renowned. So they've got all the staff you could ever wish for, high quality of play and fantastic auditioning. And when they started tracking data, they realized that only 29% of their rounds were on pace, 31% were within 10, and there was a significant uh, portion of the play that was uh, 20 to over 40 minutes over. And obviously this is where the pain points that we looked at earlier, where we're now stealing time from people and the flow is probably not as, as good as it should be. Now with a better management of uh, their on-course um, experience and with better uh, performance management and tracking and usage, usage of data, they managed to turn this around to, to push 53% on pace, 35% within 10 minutes, and they really did away with all of those nasty 30 and 40 minute over uh, pain points. So this is, in terms of the pace, the average round time has come down, sure, from 4.41 to 4.25, but what they've really done is improved the flow significantly. And obviously there's a number of, of, of variables that, that come into play for this. Um, just to uh, have a quick look of what this looks like in our world. So we are providing all this data and we're making sense of uh, all these moving parts on the course at any time and providing an opportunity for um, anyone who's got a touch point with, uh, with the on-course experience to really have a full view of the data and the trends and the history all at the touch of a button. And obviously we uh, provide the ability to, to manage and track data across uh, time periods, um, across daily performance, across whole by whole performance. We're looking at starter accuracy. Uh, you remember this sum that we wanted to look at just now? How does a starter feature in this set of variables? We're looking at the pace distribution, which is uh, what we've just looked at. So this is a one-on-one -on -one, um, data metric that, um, that we look at. And obviously we want to put that into context. What is the goal time or variable goal times that we're applying uh, during the day? Um, how were they applied? What's the weather like? Um, are marshals being efficient? Is our starter being efficient? Um, are players compliant? And what is the capacity and, and, the, and the volume of play out there? So that we've got a full data context um, of what is happening in real time and also historically. And uh, this now gets a new, um, what we call generation two front end so that there is uh, a two-way uh, interfacing that's possible and all this magic uh, intelligence um, can add value to the golfer directly. This is an option and obviously that also allows for uh, additional uh, service and service level opportunities uh, including <laughs> drinks and, and weather alerts and so on. It's, it's just a nice way to two-way interface and really uh, let the, the players self-manage, even though it's also possible to run this in a black mode where the players don't even look at it and they're just going to alert when it matters. Okay, we want you to look at the Smarter Starter, how Smarter Starter process set the pace and keep golfers accountable. Now, this is very important uh, because we looked at our worst case and our starter was 20 minutes off and then he sent us off at a poor... Um, interval. So important to start on time and important also to guide players to that start point so that they know the expectations, how long does it take to get there, um, where do we need to go, especially if it's guests. Um, we want to mind the gap, so keep that gap time true, keep the intervals true. This is really, really important, can't be underestimated and you would know your course well enough. Are you running it at nine minutes, ten minutes, are you running a um, an interval that alternates, um, is it 11, is it 7, is it 7 or 8? Um, do you change this depending on the time of day? Um, some courses um, that get quite smart with data, they know that they can run a tighter interval early in the morning and then they stretch it a little bit uh, later in the afternoon. It's important to manage the flow. The flow is so key. Um, so as a starter, we're not just a, a machine that clocks people out and a traffic manager. We also want to engage with people. We want to understand what are the likely variables of the play? What's the age, the gender, um, the handicap, um, their mobility? Are they likely to play of appropriate tees? And if I understand that a little bit in conversation, then I can maybe manage that gap a little bit in their favor. <laughs> so I can send them out uh, a minute early if I think that it'll, it'll help them and it'll uh, give them a little bit of breathing space with a group behind them, or maybe even two. Um, because uh, I've established that they're probably not going to hit as far. So there's no risk of them going into the back of the next group. Um, I want to have a little bit of, uh, of play as to how I manage this flow at the same time 
um, the clockwork obviously is uh, is the guiding is the guiding light here. Remind players of the pace policies and expectations. So as a starter, you are an experienced manager, and this is a key touch point because you're sending people off. Um, and uh, you really want to make sure that they understand uh, what they're in for. So that uh, comes down to whether it comes down to, okay, there's a headwind on this corner. Um, the setup today is like this. So it's not just a, a question of, especially if it's a guest, um, it's not just a question of if, if, if he or she asks any playing tips and for the starter to joke and say, yeah, I hit the ball straight. Um, there, there really is an experience, op um, experience management opportunity here that should be taken. And one of those key um, aspects is the pace policy. And, and this is something that ideally should be scripted. And even if the, um, the starter now says this and, and sings this tune 50 times a day, it really doesn't matter. And it, it hits home the point and it makes sure that, uh, that players are accountable and they can't say, oh, we didn't know and we weren't aware. Um, another learning, and obviously we've got data to back this up, uh, and, uh, and this is, uh, is common sense, is the first groups out are critical. So um, as well as these can be controlled, uh, the better. Um, remind players of risk areas for bottlenecks. So this is, uh, goes back to um, you know, expectations, management, and, and uh, explaining the playability of the course and managing them early. So this is where a starter sometimes functions as a, a marshal or a starter interacts with a marshal. And marshalling obviously is one of the things that we really empower, but we're not looking at today in detail. And um, one of the key things is to identify impact zones, especially in the first nine. So where can I have an impact as a, as a player assistant, even if it's a positive uh, impact and saying, hey, you guys are well on pace, keep it up. And by the way, this is the layout today. Remember to do this, the drinks card is on this hole. So that um, a marshal as well as a, a starter always experience managers. And these impact zones are key. Um, and it's great how the data actually confirms uh, how these impact zones uh, make sense and how these impact zones really work in terms of uh, if you place a person in this position at this time of day, that's when they're most efficient. Uh, I can imagine Jim Lombardo laughing here on, uh, over in, at Erin Hills because it's something that we've actually learned from them. So um, we probably should have uh, uh, trademarked that, but uh, we, we'll try and buy your beer next time, Jim. Okay, last uh, two more to go. Um, we've got... Time equals bottom line. How does a time influence bottom line results? What are the risks and opportunities? There's quite a few factors into this. Um, experience, a good experience obvious, obviously equals loyalty and that equals repeat play. And obviously the wish to play more at this, at this club. The risk is your delayed round starts, your slow rounds, um, all this nasty red that we looked at when we looked at our time budget. And uh, we're seeing this across um, the medium to low performing courses that are starting, especially starting out on, on our system, that there's always a 6 to 10% risk uh, group um, that, uh, that doesn't have the optimal experience. So if you're looking at this um, from a numbers point of view, so if you've got eight months busy season, you do 4,000 rounds a month. Um, so that gives you around about 32,000 rounds a year. If you've got a 6% rounds at risk that's around about 2000 rounds and if you risk a drop off of 30 percent that is obviously quite significant so that means that's people that have come and you've got a chance to prove yourself or to give them another chance at golf or maybe they really uh, would like to play more but they can't find the time and now they're part of this risk um this risk bracket and they're coming through at an hour over that there's a really high high risk that these guys might drop off but what obviously what you're trying to breed is opportunity thinking and an open mind around improvement so at the same time you can look at this as an opportunity so if we we can turn these 30 percent of players into repeat players and they're coming um, in for repeat rounds they're doing another round with us and then um, a part uh, later on in the season do another one I've spent marketing budget once and I've turned this into a three times uh, the return on investment. Obviously in the private space, opportunity is to convert guests to members. Um, not, not all private clubs have got a long waiting list and those who do, um, do so for a reason and uh, part of that often is the experience is exceptional and those who don't can with that experience tweak and uh, taking the time of the uh, members seriously, um, they can 
turn guests into members. And obviously this is the goal often. Uh, what we sometimes see is, and that's going back to the, that uh, conditioning question, outstanding golf course, but seriously slow pace. So again, like people acknowledge that this place is in great shape, but the experience that uh, they've had was poor. So this is a risk, especially when it comes to uh, guest play and first time. So first impressions. And if we're thinking back at the restaurant business, uh, if you're going somewhere for, for the first time because you've read about the place or because um, somebody's told you about them or because you happen to be in town, uh, you are very, very unlikely to um, give them good ratings. You're very unlikely to refer them, very unlikely to go, to go back if things don't work out. So that risk, if we can reduce it, uh, is worth a lot. Um, we also looked at the, the risk of eating into people's time budget. And if we've got this uh, significantly delayed or significantly over goal time status. The opportunity here is if we use the same yardstick, eight months busy season and uh, 4,000 rounds, 6% rounds at risk. The food and beverage, if we think $30, persons, what a, uh, $30 what a person might spend. And obviously, if we're freeing up people's time, that also allows for pro shop spend. If we're stealing people's time, they're unlikely to make a turn at the pro shop. So the improvement op opportunity around this, just from a, a pure mass point of view, is another $60,000. And that's just if we take care of that 6% rounds at risk. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that we get that done at 100%, but if we look for continuous improvement, we can go plus 1% improvement um, that uh, adds up very quickly and obviously over time uh, significantly. Lastly, we wanted to look at time equals money, real life examples. So time is an important uh, experience uh, factor and time is important in today's day and age and we have to be mindful of it and, and take it seriously. So if we can do this better, and if the times come down, um, what opportunities do we have uh, to, to turn that into revenue at a cost because we're running a business? So if we run better processes, if we've got actionable data, if we've got oversight, if we manage performance, and if we set the standards and look for continuous improvement, we empower results uh, within our staff, um, then we can add capacity. And capacity obviously generates revenue. So that's a, the, the age old, if I fly my plane at 80% or my airline at 80% uh, versus 85% yield, um, this is uh, very, very profitable because the operating costs are virtually the same. But if I can get more people out um, or onto the flight, then obviously that's uh, highly profitable additional seats. And it's much, much the same with the golf course. We understand that um, not everybody is full all the time, but during peak season, on those two or two and a half busy days a week, that's when it really matters. And we do have some real life examples and we're fully mindful that these are not your average courses, uh, but these are uh, numbers that, that they provided. So at Erin Hills, um, 25 weeks per season, it's a short season uh, because it, uh, it gets cold and, and snowy in Wisconsin. Um, that's 175 days an average of three players um, extra. If you adding additional capacity, so that means one additional tee of time. And if you sell 75% of that, what does that mean? So to them, it means effectively 150 additional tee of time times times 450 golfers. If we're working on three of those sold and that uh, adds up to $126,000 a season. Um, at Whistling Straits, which, which is down the road, they also confirmed that uh, adding capacity through better processes, better management, better oversight is worth over $100,000 a season. Um, we're mindful that they're charging a royal fee, um, but this also applies to, uh, to much more um, average courses that, uh, and obviously this is also, as I said, the bulk of the course that we work with are working in or around or under the $50 um, green fee. So if you do the math here, if you've got uh, six rounds generated per busy field and a field obviously is half a day, um, then that when you've got five a week, um, that is probably going to be your Saturday. That's probably going to be uh, your Thursday or your Wednesday and maybe half a day on a Sunday. Um, that means two and a half, 22 and a half busy fields a, a month. Um, that's 157 over the season. And so and so many rounds, that's almost a thousand. And if we if we can sell a certain percentage of those, uh, that is worth another forty thousand in in revenue opportunity. If you do this well, so 
if we just um, summarize what we've looked at, um, understanding the importance of, um, of a consistency and how unforgiving we are as consumers elsewhere. So should we not apply the same standards to our golf course? Um, how the, the pace affects uh, the flow um, on the course affects the experience. Um, the smarter starter, and this is one of the uh, variables that we're looking to tweak and that are key. And then how time equals money. And, and uh, just looking at the last two examples, time equals money, uh, there's a, an, a huge opportunity for additional revenue. But first and foremost, if we do this really well, the opportunity that we have to create better experiences for our players is, uh, is uh, enormous. And this is obviously ultimately why we're in business. How are we doing for time? Um, we well, are pretty pacey on pace. I hope that there are a few questions, many questions, any questions, any comments. Um, I would love to try and field them or hand them over to one of my colleagues who's also on the line. So if you would like to, uh, just type them in. Um, anything that uh, that you would like to ask or anything that you would like to comment on. Okay, no questions. Um, Maybe what I should do is just uh, give you an outline of where we're going um, in in the next few months. So I'm very excited to be at the at TechCon conference um, in Las Vegas in mid-October, uh, where we'll be speaking on uh, data A to Z in, uh, in golf. Um, that's a panel that we've joined by um, a few other uh, good operators in the business. So, and obviously there's uh, the PGA show coming up in end of January, which uh, to many of you is far away, but uh, to us uh, who we're looking to exhibit and launch uh, a new product uh, tier is, um, is already part of our planning. So very exciting. And obviously we're also excited that we're going to add another million rounds tracked um, in the next month alone. And uh, obviously there's opportunity around uh, using that data for, um, uh, okay, there's a, uh, there's a question coming through here. Um, are we still selling the passive non-screen used uh, base tags? Yes, we do. Uh, and we, this is obviously where we've come from in terms of uh, where do we get the, the on-screen flow data from? Where do we get the player movement data and positional data from? So we use the tags, uh, the tag marshal, original tag marshal generation one tracker. And this is something that is very appropriate on many, many courses that don't necessarily want a two-way screen interface uh, because they're after a, a classic golf experience. And it also works really well when installed into carts. So the new generation screen um, works uh, in, in, the, in the cart space, but it also is something that the players can interface with. And there's obviously additional value with uh, yardage and range finding, or um, it just makes sure that uh, the system can communicate and the pro shop can communicate with the players at all times. And obviously that's where system um, pace information that is accurate updates the players so they can self-manage their rounds. Uh, and this is something that the market is really wanting. So that is why we, we're going with this option. Um, at the same time, um, the, the non-screen classic option also obviously remains available. So this is one new front end. Uh, but all that this provides, and obviously that is the back, uh, backbone of our, of our system, is a golf course intelligence platform. So all this new front end provides is data to feed into this platform, and that doesn't change. And the old devices can do this just as well. Okay, how affordable is Tag Marshall? Well, um, we normally work on, a, we, we can break our cost down to a, a cents per, per round. And normally that is in the region of 20 to 40 cents per round. And if we're looking at the experience opportunity, um, this we believe is extremely affordable. And if we're looking at the return on investment opportunity, which in most cases is a 10x or sometimes even 20, 30x, um, it pays for itself and some. 
So you get all the data, you get um, exceptional handle on your operation and keeping everyone accountable, including the players. Um, and at the same time, uh, you're generating additional revenue. So it's, it's more of a question of, um, of can you afford not to uh, look into this opportunity? But uh, yeah, thanks for the question. We'd love to chat and obviously it all comes down to how many tags, how many devices would your course need? How many months of the season do you operate? And uh, how many cards do you have? Uh, but generally uh, we can get started under $500 a month and um, in a higher volume uh, uh, situation that might uh, double or be a bit more than double, but this really comes down to fleet size and obviously a number of active seasons a month. So thank, thanks for that question, very good question. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions. So I would like to thank you for your time and uh, I hope that you will come and uh, look for us at the Golf Tech Con and obviously at the PGA show. And if you have any questions, any suggestions, comments in the meantime, uh, please um, uh, get in touch with uh, myself or, or any of our, my colleagues. And obviously we will make this uh, a web link available. So if you want to look at this again or look at it, some detail of it or share it with somebody, uh, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, and you know, as, as I said, any questions at any time, you're welcome uh, to ask. And we also have a, another, another a round of, of webinars coming up uh, also with the GCMA in the UK. So there's lots more information that we're looking to share. And for uh, the next one or two, there'll also be a guest joining us and giving us really first-hand operational insights and how other courses are using, are using data and getting results. Thanks everyone for your time. Um, really appreciate it.